Okay, um, so it's my pleasure today to introduce Hector Peinado from Spain. Uh, Hector did his PhD in the laboratory of Dr. Amparo Cano in Madrid, and later he joined Dr. David Leiden's laboratory at Well Cornell Medicine as a postdoc in 2008. His work there defined the role tumor secreted exosomes in pre-metastatic niche formation and in the education of the tumor microenvironment. So he joined the CNIO in 2015 as the group leader of the laboratory of microenvironment and metastasis. So today he's going to give us a lecture on the role of tumor secreted exosomes in metastasis and their potential use in liquid biopsies. So thank you so much, Carolina and Jan, for this invitation. I'm really glad, you know, to join this event. And also I would like, you know, to thank for, I already told you, you know, the web if we talk, I think it's a really nice um, period, let's say that way for if we talk, but not bad for the people. But I think we have to take advantage of the novel ideas that you guys have. I'm really glad to, I mean, I'm following you all like during, I, I think since April or something like that. Uh, but of course, uh, I have to say that this is giving me a lot of bills because this is my LinkedIn uh, profile. And I see like, I, I, I gain like seven, 700% 700 more people like looking my, my profile since, since you did this. So for me, it's a really nice also idea for maybe we can think of about betting environment or something like that. Because if I bet myself, I don't know, 100 bucks last week, I will have like a lot of money by today. So really, really nice to, to see that it is coming out and, uh, you know, the, the ideas and we can discuss. I put to get today uh, some of the ideas of our previous work but also uh, novel work that we are doing and the ones that we published last year you know, about the use in liquid biopsy. Uh, so first, I, I want just to, to say a little bit of uh, what I do in the lab. Uh, normally, we are really interested in this tumor progression on how actually the tumor cross talk with the microenvironment and how you know tumor cells are probably around 55% of the tumor mass, but the rest of the cells are immune cells, are cancer-associated fibroblasts. So there are other cells types like microenvironmental cells that they cross talk. So when I was back in, in David's slide and when I was in, in the US, we were wondering how two more can cross talk with the microenvironment and if my extracellular vesicles, at that time we called them micro vesicles because that was really early, but we found out later that there were exosomes. But overall, if EVs can be a novel method for the tumor cells, not only for cross talking the primary tumor, but also if they can be shed out in the bloodstream, in the lymphatic system, they can actually play a role in, in a concept that I'm going to introduce today about the concept of the premetastatic niche, which is a microenvironment that is formed before the tumor cells are coming here. And also, what is the role of these EVs during tumor progression and metastasis? Because in our lab, we are basically interested in metastatic behavior. So uh, the first thing was basically to understand what is the concept of the premetastatic niche. As I said, I was with David Leiden in, in Cornell. He was pioneer with Rusi Kaplan in the ideas of how the tumor is evolving, but also secreting factors that they can impact in distal organs. So basically, uh, we have a tumor, but the microenvironment is, is changing. And along the tumor progression, they are somehow promoting changes in other organs. And they are normally you know, understood as a new soil for metastasis. I'm not sure if you know the theory of uh, Fiddler about the seed, which is the tumor cells, and the soil, which is the tumor cell. They need a specific microenvironment to be successful in the metastasis. So we believe, and the hypothesis was, that maybe security factors that was already published and exosomes at that time, they were involved in the pre-metastatic niche formation. Now that was, you know, the start of my postdoc there. After that, you know, we published several papers, but the idea was that in the pre-metastatic niche, we have changes from the primary tumor. We have solo factors that they can be shed out by the tumors. They, they basically promote changes locally, such as the vascular leakiness, inflammation, ECM remodeling, and all these changes are important because they are preceded before any cancer cell are getting there. So that's why it's called pre-metastatic niche. So these are changes that they probably last like your seconds, minutes in the metastatic progression before tumor changes are getting there. So that was, 
you know, the topic that was in the in David's lab. And we were really wondering if maybe in this case, exosomes can actually play a role. Uh, that was probably in 2008 when I started that. Exosomes do play a role here. Are they somehow involved in the premetastatic niche or not? So this is, you know, interesting topic that was at that time, but for us it was like a challenging question, right? Uh, like probably now they become like a most a as a topic, but you know, that we were really interested. So in this setting, uh, we know that in the primary tumor itself, there's a lot of going on that we reviewed this uh, in 2013, like in the primary tumor, there's a lot of crosstalk with the fibroblasts, with the myeloid cells, with the endothelial cells. We found that they actually crosstalk with bone marrow progenitor cells. But we became, at least in my lab, we became interested. And most of the talk today, the first part was going to be in what is the crosstalk of the primary tumor with lymph nodes? Because I'm probably you know that lymph nodes are the first, normally first region where the, in this case, melanoma cells can metastasize. So we believe that exosomes actually play a role in the lymph node premetastatic niche formation. But besides that, there was a lot of literature, which I'm really happy to, to, you know, to know that uh, exosomes, they do play a role also in metastasis, not only in the primary tumor. And in this metastatic setting, in this review, they put like three different topics that I believe they are important. You know, one is initiation, what is EMT, so epithelial to mesenchymal transition, intravasation, local changes in the primary tumor, and how they tumor cell they impact in tumor cell homing. But uh, before, besides that, there is a, a lot of going on in the premetastatic niche formation, and there is also a whole new world, of course, on how how they impact in the immune regulation. We are interested in how exosomes impact in immune regulation, but in the context of those premetastatic niches, which I think is a whole new world on how tumor secreted TBs or exosomes can modulate the immune cells. It's a, a fa fascinating topic, but it's really, really time demanding as well. But maybe this is the most, uh, I have to confess that when I was a postdoc, for me, I, I was blown up basically by the idea of the papers that were already published suggesting this horizontal transfer of molecules. So how a tumor can just transfer the phenotype of a tumor cells to the micromelanoma. So for me, I have to say that was my motivation of how to see if a piece of information can be shared out and you know just shared with the micromelanoma. So this micromelanoma can be uh, as a concept that we 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 coined called educated. So basically, we are educating somehow this microenvironment. And for me, it was really you know a novel idea. I was attracted when I was a postdoc. So for 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 that, it was really really nice to see that there are many many uh, biomolecules that can be in the exosome: protein, RNA, DNA. You know, I, I learned a lot of with Jan's uh, work, RNA, how can be transferred and all this. So for me, it was fascinating. We focus mostly in proteins, I have to say, because uh, I was working in, uh, we'll see now, uh, in an oncoprotein, oncogene CMET. So for us, we're seeing like maybe oncoproteins can be, you know, I also learned a lot from, from RAC. Uh, word like saying like maybe oncoproteins can be transferred to the microenvironment. They can educate it and corrupt. The word is corrupting the microenvironment. So for us, was really, really interesting. And at the very last part of the talk, I'm going to show how, besides this molecular information that can be transferred and interesting data, if we can use them as a biomarkers, because I, I like to put in always in my, you know, in my work, a, a little bit of, uh, translational studies. So how it's good to know the biology, but for me, it's also important to uh, understand how these uh, biomarkers can be used in the clinic. If we can help somehow uh, the diagnosis or the prognosis of patients. So I'm going to show a little bit of the paper we published last year about the use of the novel biofluid and EVs on that. So starting with the first story, uh, it all started with this paper we published in Nature Medicine with David that where we saw basically that melanoma cell can secrete exosomes and they can uh, basically uh, form premetastatic niches, and not only in the lungs, but also they, we saw, we have evidences, although that paper was focused mostly in distal metastasis, we saw evidences in leaf node metastasis, which is the story I'm going to talk to you today. And also importantly, that was attractive because uh, besides having a role in the premetastatic niche, 
we saw that somehow they are cross-talking with bone marrow. So they are influencing the bone marrow cell mobilization and that the mechanism was really fascinating how melanoma cells can basically uh, put the oncogene cement. So basically the H receptor can be in the surface of this exosome and they can be transferring that the signaling from the melanoma to the bone marrow. And this was promoting the bone marrow cell mobilization. And at that time, that was really interesting for me also that the two systems, so the first system of permetastatic misformation and the bone marrow cell mobilization, they were all somehow, uh, you know, mm, coordinated in the metastatic setting. So that was the main idea that we put in that paper. Exosome can promote premetastatic niche formation and bone marrow cell mobilization to form this uh, premetastatic niche in distal organs. Later in David's lab, also there were some, some papers by Ayuko and Bruno and Tan Long that they basically put this that integrins in the surface of that exosome. They also promote a specific homing in metastatic organs. And we, we somehow put some ideas that tumors that they are really prone to metastasis in the specific organs. They produce a, a specific messages in those exosomes with a specific integrins in the surface. And this is letting them, I wouldn't say to really intelligent go to that organ, but it's more like a, a dynamic. So if you have a, a, a specific combination of integrins, they, they basically promote to slow down those integrins in the lungs or in the liver or in the brain. And this is forming the premetastatic niche formation. And in that work, that was really nice work. We saw that this alpha six beta one was basically uh, directing exosome to the lung, also alpha six beta four. But in the case of alpha B beta five was uh, targeting those exosomes to the liver. They promote the premetastatic niche formation, increasing S100 proteins and basically inflammation. And that comes as is all the time. We see always where the exosome goes, they see inflammation, normally vascular leakiness as well, and also extracellular matrix uh, re rearrangement and immunoregulation. So this all come that exosomes secretes, they, they form premetastatic niches by this four mechanisms. Somehow is they are parallelisms and they are a specific mechanism, but the overall mechanism are those three, four that I mentioned. And at the very last part of the, of the talk, I wanted to give an overview of the potential use of EVs in liquid biopsy, because, you know, we all have this uh, idea that EVs can be in the plasma, can be shared out. Besides many other markets. Now we have, uh, of course, cell-free DNA, we have platelets, we have circulating tumor cells. But of course, if we work in EVs, we, we really love EVs to see, okay, can we use it as a potential biomarker, not just to diagnose, but also uh, to progno do prognosis of patients or follow up and predict the outcome of, 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 of the patients because the reality in the clinic, normally they reach the clinic normally when they have already disease. So it's important to know which is the risk group or not. So for me, it was really the idea. No? Of course, EVs are only, well, you put here exosome, but you can put EVs overall, otherwise ICEP will tell you what are you talking about. So exosomes, no, I, EVs can be really useful because they, they do carry DNA, they do carry protein, they do carry RNA, they have active um, packaging of material, they are circulating, they are encapsulated, but there are many others, of course, depending on the on the field that you, or the crowd that you talk to, they will say, okay, but I do play this and I'm doing fine or circulating free DNA. RNA also is coming really a hot topic to look for RNA, but I'm going to focus on EVs because, uh, you know, was my topic. And of course, I, we wanted to look on how EVs can be used in circulation as a trackers of biomarkers, right? And there are some, I always like this, uh, this slide, but probably you guys are aware of this already because in the crowd, when I go to, the, to you know, to meetings uh, with MDs, they want, okay, I'm going to give you like 100,000 milliliters of plasma and you tell me the biomarker. I say, okay, this is really, 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 really tough because of course, you know, two more reFVs uh, this is something I did when I was in David's. Uh, we we quantitative, quantified the amount of EVs 
from the tumor in the plasma. And we believe it's less than 10%, probably are less than 1%, but at least we can say with confidence in, in the experiment, and this is not public, but we did some assays. The idea is that there is a minority of EVs coming from the tumor. So of course, having plasma is fine, having any biofluid, but you have to know what to look for. Otherwise, you're, you're lost. I'm, I'm lost most of my project because I don't know which protein, unless I have, you know, I have a HER2 protein and HER2 uh, breast cancer, so I will go for HER2, right? But it's not like black and white all the time, unfortunately. So uh, what we do normally is to look for a specific proteins is my was my first topic today i'm going to talk a little bit of dna because I, I think we have really nice data of course rna is important also because if you have for example a mutation in the codifying region you can find it in the RNA. and actually rna is a winner as well in the evs and we have many other things you know lipid sugar but the reality comes to our mind that okay whatever you look is going to be in minority so normally you know proteomics, uh, RNA-6, all this, you, you are going to spend money, but probably you will you will see what is the system, not reality, the biomarker. But basically the, the idea I wanted to share today, because I will show you some data of our last work is telling that, okay, you have to know what to look for. And this is because I am myself, when I was a postdoc, actually I was looking uh, to more of exosomes. And actually this is my work, you know, we have TRP2, BLA4, MET, they are fine, you know, of course, we publish, we all publish probably papers in a biomarker, but I have to say that in the field, there is not like a New England, whoever publishes a New England Journal of Medicine in the future, just let me know, we will collaborate definitely because it is important to know that we really need to have the marker in clinical studies. And this is challenging, it's challenging for me, challenging for you, but it's important to have the market that can tell us in the clinic, so in the reality, that with a high confidence that you can use as a biomarker of anything. This is challenging for, for everyone and in every cancer type, of course, and in every approach, also for circulating free. But I think we really get together because there are limitations right now. Yeah, what we have, we need a standardization. We are fighting, well, Jan is fighting probably most uh, to have a standardization collection in the material, in the protocol. We all are aware that depending on the lab sometimes, and also on the system, you use plasma, I use serum, I use ultra, I use site exclusion. We, and with respect, we are having a messy situation. We have many, many, they are all valid, but I think to standardize, we really need to, you know, stop, think, observe and proceed, but to have a really uh, a specification. I wouldn't say like, okay, let's do it all in my way. No, my way is the, it's a good way, but as good as yours. But at least we should specify what was your way so I can, you know, follow up. But I think this is, you know, th something in the field that we really need to, to improve. And we are, we are. I think, honestly, we are improving, but, you know, we will need more time. Problems that we face in 2020, besides COVID, no, that we are facing these problems. Uh, we have that the two more EVs, they represent a minority. And I have to say, and I, I'm, I'm not shy to say that, unbiased analysis, at least from my side, are not recommendable. And I'm going to show you why, because we have some data that we did proteomic, we were happy, we were waiting for a biomarker, and we couldn't find it because we have a limitation. The microenvironment, EVs. So hematogenous EVs, they, they are a majority. So sometimes uh, when you look for proteomics or you look rna seq you find yourself in a, in, a, in a lost in translation of what it means. It would mean something, but probably systemically something, not related to the biomarker. But of course, maybe if you are able to purify only melanoma exon or tumor exon, you are more successful. And if you do, just tell me, because it's important to basically be sure that we have it only tumor derived exosomes and do those unbiased analysis only in tumor derived exosomes. We have a trick in the lab to use explant friend tumors so we can reduce the the the, say the the amount of hematopoietic derived EVs, but we still have a stroma, fibroblasts, endotheliasis, all this that they will be in there. But at least we found that a, a explant, and I think the paper David published. You no, know, we we published a paper with David Leiden uh, in August, and uh, they use explant, and we started to use explant when I was there, and that was is a really nice alternative if you guys are interested. Also, we are dependent on the methods. Uh, sometimes it's like I say, okay, they, they offer me 
a lot of material and say, okay, um, it's fine, but we really need to use a specific, that, let's say, uh, uh, analysis, right? To, to, to do really how this market is needed. So at the very end, the biomarkers in, in, in EVs are, we are really searching for the holy grail. As I say, we are fo focused in DNA and protein. We focus in protein before and mostly later on in DNA. And this is because we we believe there are pros and cons in circulating free DNA and EVs. But of course, what we are going is in here. We are increasing the sensibility by unifying EVs, nucleic acid, and also circulating free DNA. So we are combining in the, in the study we published, we not only focus on exosome DNA and RNA, but also we combine it to circulating free DNA. So we have really an increasing sensibility. And that was the last part of the, of the talk is, we do see we have novel approaches for liquid biopsy. We were using, uh, as you know, our way for plasma, but we were using a, a, lymph, a biofluid called seroma. It is coming post lymphadenectomy. They normally put a drainage, so they, they do surgery in melanoma patient, they put a drainage. And this, after four, 24, 48 hours, they take this drainage. Normally they dump it, they don't use it. So we believe that maybe there are biomarkers and EBs in those, uh, uh, seromas can be used for uh, minimal residual disease analysis. So this is the story we published last year and we believe we have data. We do see it really going fast because this is already published. Seroma, they do have a lot of more particles. They are bigger and we see the size is bigger. You see uh, it's a completely novel biofluid. We did proteomic assay and this is what I told you that maybe unbiased analysis is not working because of course, we did proteomic in a serial, the same, sero, same patient, plasma and seroma. And we do see that this is uh, divided by the biological fluid, not by patient, not by disease. So this is something that it is important to know the limitations of proteomics. We are normally looking what is called the, um, let's say systemic EBs. The important uh, over observation we have that seroma is a really enriched biofluid, not only in EVs, but also in margin, protein markers. We see it's enriched also in DNA. So we do see there is a rich biofluid. So for us, we can increase the sensibility of detection. We did analysis and this is the bad news. So uh, this unbiased analysis, you have a highly malignant patient with highly advanced disease or lower advanced disease. We did a cluster, we couldn't find this biomarker with this holy grail, we couldn't find it. However, I like to say that we smell, we can smell a little bit of the pathway, see map, map, of course they are melanoma, so we see map kinase activation, but we couldn't find the biomarker. And I have to say that after looking at this, or maybe we need this uh, assay that we use with David, you know, doing uh, artificial intelligence to find 20 markers at a time, that's fine. You know, you can engineer and you have a smart enough people, you can engineer this to have your biomarker, but at this time, for looking for a unique biomarker, we couldn't find it. So I'm sorry, I have to cheat it on proteins and we moved to the DNA because uh, we found those of pa those patients were BRAF mutants, some of them. So we basically use the analysis of what we call EVs, extracellular basic nucleic acids. So we combine circulating free DNA with circulating EVs, the RNA and the DNA in order to detect the BRAF and BRAF mutation by itself. We, with BRAF wild type, we do see that the seroma, as I told you, is a highly enriched biofluid. So if you're thinking that maybe you can have access to seroma post lymphadenectomy in any other disease, you will have a greener biofluid. You have a lot more than plasma. But of course, depending on the disease, also it is closer to the analysis of the, of the area of the injury, right? You have melanoma cells, you will have it around the seroma area. So we are enriching not only in particle, but also in potential biomarkers. But the next step was to really detect the mutation, right? So we look for the BRA mutation. We do see that those patients who were positive in the mutation, they were all progressing, all of them. Some of them that there were BRA wild type, a percentage of them, they are progressing. So, and we are looking for additional marker. We, we maybe need uh, this uh, combination of markers, not only BRA, but also BRA with other a panel of mutation to really find what is going on in here. But the good news is only looking for BRA, we do see a really high sensitivity for detection of those patients who are progressing. This is telling us that 
remember this is post lymphadenectomy. So melanoma patient, they got uh, surgery. We took the drainage the day after. So if there is a mutation, it is likely that they have active disease. We didn't prove in this paper, but it is telling us this idea. So we do detect with high sensitivity those, those who progress, but also you can tell me, okay, Hector, these are Vera, they will progress anyway. That they do, they do. But also, so this is tissue. If you look only for tissue, they will tell you this will progress. But also we believe that the analysis in seroma can tell us earlier. So the day after or in the week after that they will progress. So I think it's a really time window that I'm not going to sell you the idea, but it's something that we believe in the future, not only in melanoma, maybe in breast cancer, maybe other cancer type that you are working with, maybe the drainage that you take out from these patients, you can use it in this case, be rough, but you, you may have your own biomarker. So I think it's a good potential biofluid. And the last part is just, this is the last slide. I want to, you know, sell this idea that, you know, seroma, post lymphadenectomy could be any easy assets and actually it's dumped. So basically you can take it for free if you do have a protocol to do that. They have a lot more like 800 times more particles than, than plasma. They have a higher concentration of molecules. It is anatomically closer to the disease. So we have the percentage of changes. If there is a biomarker percentage of changes compared to, to plasma is higher. It is useful, of course, to monitor minimal residual disease post surgery. Plasma is useful for diagnosis, likely, so it's depending on the approach of your project. In our case, we found actually that EBs are superior to circulating free DNA, and it's only in one milliliter. In, and I say that because uh, we did that with another hospital. They, they detected circulating free DNA and they couldn't detect the mutation. We did it in EBs and we could probably is because of the protocol we use. We concentrate the particles, so maybe it's a matter of sensibility. So here the message is the increase of sensitivity will give us the chances to catch this. So, and that was, uh, you know, the final message at the very last part is just, you know, two more EVs, they are uh, potential biomarkers. They do represent heterogeneity. They are sensible. They are studies telling us that circulating free DNA is equal to DNA, but, EVs are superior in protein and RNA. In our hands, it's also superior in seroma. They are complementary, of course, uh, to other approaches. I wouldn't go only for exosomes, of course, because in our case, uh, we call EVs and the combination of EVs. So it matters the sensibility. When it comes to diagnosis, sometimes you have to raise. Maybe you don't have the biological system, the specific model, but we do have sensibility. So this is mother in the clinics. And as I say, maybe we are focused on two more EVs, but people working in environment, they can use perfectly, you know, exosomes in circulation for log immunity, uh, reaction or uh, inflammation. So this is really uh, the, another part, we have two more on micromarine. So this is really interesting into that. Last slide, I'm going to a little bit of the ties of Spanish vesicle bodies association that we have this JVEX because we are having a mini symposium here December 17 which I, you whoever is you know in the in the JVEX but also is member of any society is welcome to come we have a couple of invited speakers Anne and Andrew they will come if you would like to join us you know this is our web and these are all the meeting you go to courses and meeting and you just can sign up and you have to demonstrate that you are either ISEP or anyone's you know uh, uh, situation in your country, so we will search you. And at the end, very, very end, I'm going to really thank my people besides the organizing, Jan and Carolina, of course, the people in my lab. Susana, who is probably the, you know, the, the leader of the two projects I presented today, staff scientists in my lab, and the rest of the people and the collaborators finding sources, of course. And, you know, I thank you guys for your attention. I hope I'm in time. Yeah, 45 minutes, so we are five minutes. Uh, sorry, I talk a lot. So this is something else. So thank you so no, much. No, it's for fine. That. Okay, that's fine. Thank you very much, Hector. Um, and now we come over to the discussion part. And the beauty with this format, Hector, is that we don't really have any time limits. Okay, if you start speaking for an hour and a half or three hours or something, <laughs> then people might get exhausted, but we, we continue until we're done. Uh, yeah, definitely. which is usually an hour 15 minutes. So uh, what I want to say to the audience is that please put your, na uh, na put your question into the chat. 
Uh, and uh, I will un let you unmute and then you can ask your question uh, live. So, um, but, but I mean, I think it's really fascinating to look at the interaction between different types of extracellular vesicles and the lymph nodes uh, and, the, and how, it's, how the inflammation is regulated. Now, my, you, know, you talked about a lot about the, the uh, uh, lymph vessels, right? Yeah, and, and and but if you if you and, and of course if you have a tissue, and, and you I'm sure you know we'll be looking Rosella in our lab. She's I can see her face here. We've been working on isolating vesicles directly from uh, tissues, and the the most likely way they leave the tissue is through the lymphatics, right? Yeah, because that's the natural flow of of biomaterials from a tissue. And before they go into the circulation, they will go through a lymph node, right? So which Donna. cell are most likely to take up the exosomes from, uh, from, uh, from, a, from any tissue in the lymph node? Which cells are most likely in your, in your mind? Yeah, yeah, so we focus on, you know, there is a limitation also in the, strainer capacity of the lymph nodes. So lymph nodes are basically like a strainer. So basically they have really tight pores. So they can material, big material will be most likely in the subcortical area. And, and this area are basically uh, lymphatic endothelial cells and macrophages. So the fact that we are finding melanoma exosomes in the lymphatic endothelial cells and the macrophages is because the, I think there is a physical stopped or structure in the lymph node. And this may happen with other EB. So any other EBs coming from the other normal system, normal mm -hmm. EBs, they will be in there as well. The thing is the tumor has the capacity probably to corrupt them. Maybe it's a, if it's a normal EB, they will go there, they won't change. It's, it's, it's your own MHC, that's okay. You, I will detect and I will do any, I won't do anything, but in the case of the melanoma, they reprogram them. So basically they have material that they corrupt them. And this will happen basically based on size. So you have exosomes from 100 nanometer or bigger, they will likely be only in the subcortical areas. We do have in the lab evidences using collaborator with uh, people like in, in nanoparticles and all this, that if you have a smaller particles, they can go deeper. So I would expect that maybe exomeres you know, with David's work mm. and all this, they can go to other parts. So I think we have two limitations here. One is the size of the ABs and also the target. I don't think honestly that legs are a specific on macrophages in targeting, but they are barriers to that CB. So I think it's most of the of the understanding that I have. Well, my mindset is that uh, extracellular vesicles are designed to be eaten up basically. And the yeah. cells that do that mostly is macrophages, as you say, and dendritic cells, right? Yeah, but in our so. case, dendritic cells, we don't see them. But of course, I think it's because we don't have the, we have this, you know, strainer, uh, uh, say, structure. But maybe in vitro, if you do that, you will have a lot of uptakers. Uh, I mean, the other aspect around um, genetic cells, I don't, I'm not trying to hijack the discussion here, I'll let everybody in very soon, no, 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 fine. that the, they, there is also a pathway by which dendritic cells leave the tissues, go through the lymph nodes, activate T cells, and in yeah. that pro pathway, in that process, and actually already when they're in the tissue, they may take up the tumor exosomes, right? So. Yeah, totally, and you are fine. You are totally fine, and you're, I'm totally agree with you. The thing is, remember, we are focused on this pre-metastatic niche concept, so basically, it's in the short-term yeah. window after treatment. But of course, in the reality, and I, I'm not saying that my work is not reality, but understand me. In the real world, when you have a tumor, you will have this interaction. So you will have dendritic cells coming in and out. So maybe it's different, and in the setting of the immune regulation they may actually do have a role, but not in the pre-metastatic niche formation. So uh, but, uh, you are totally right. You know, the, I, I wouldn't say that B cells, dendritic cells and all T cells, they will interact much more with those vesicles, either in vivo moving out, but honestly, uh, maybe later on, I think. I think they play a role in immune reaction and immune interaction. And maybe we, it's another second story, no, that we have. 
uh, I'm sure there's much to be discovered here and to understand in the, in the actually in the immunity in general, because the lymph nodes are, of course, very important. Sander yeah. Kujmans, uh, uh, please unmute yourself and ask a question. Yes, uh, thank you very much, uh, Hector. Very nice talk. Um, I have a, a little bit of a EV skeptical question, uh, if I may. Um, so, of course, we are... We, we are all extracellular vesicle lovers and we like to talk about the role of extracellular vesicles and everything and how important they are. Um, but as you already also mentioned during your talk, um, in, your, in your studies in which you actually study the pre-metastatic niche formation, you actually inject a large dose of EVs in the mice and you see that, that things are happening. Um, I'm just wondering, what is your view on, on the actual role of EVs in pre-metastatic niche formation in the sense that if you were not to have these EVs, would pre-metastatic niche formation not occur or would it still occur but much more slower? Because of course, tumor cells secrete a lot of other factors other than EVs that might be much more important. Totally, totally. And you are totally right. You probably review my Nature Amazing paper. So that's on something that they asked us. So this is something that, and I have uh, already prepared that question because, you know, of course, it is, a, no, I wouldn't say a trick, but it's a model system that we use. But you probably can criticize also Joan Masagek work because he injects 1 million cells in the flank and they're developing a tumor. And it's a model, right? So I think we have to have in mind that we are trying to demonstrate a model and we use the tricks that we can. And in my case, this uh, we normally inject 5 micrograms per, per mice and all this. And this is actually the question they ask us in the Nature Medicines. What is the physiological meaning of this dose that you're doing. The only thing that I can tell us is this five micromass is coming from one million cells. So I'm injecting equal dose that I would inject in the flank of those, of those mice. However, you are totally right that you are overdosing because you uh, a tumor won't release one million of cells in a shot, but also one million derived particles in a shot. And we are using just a shot. Of that. So we are probably having um, overestimation, although it doesn't really, uh, and, and, you know, don't justify the effect, but we are having probably 10 times more effect than normally officially. And in my case, an answer to your question is exosomes or EVs do have a role probably in a specific homing. So while solo factor can be segregated out and all these exosomes, they are normally retained in a specific organs by this integrins or other. So the, where they stop is depending on their cargo. But of course, they are interacting with many cells and they are retained. And if you are retaining a lot of particles in the, begin, in the beginning and in the end, you will have inflammation. So I think they normally pay, you know, I, will, I wouldn't dare to say a percentage, but I have to bet 25% could be exon, 25% could be solo factor, and many other things. So I do think that they play a role, but only in a specific areas where they are able to home. Some of them will home in the lungs, some of them will home in the liver, some of them will go to the urine and wasted or destroyed by macrophages. But you are totally right that maybe in the premetastatic niche formation is too there to think, okay, you are telling me that besides having a look, you know, a specific uh, effect in the primary tumor. Are you telling me that they are going to the moon um, and just changing the moon? So Spain, uh, we probably don't have astronauts, but US do. The, uh, they send people and they modify the, the moon. So this is something that probably they are a tiny part, but I do think that they have a role in local homing in a specific scenarios in collaboration with other, not only of course EB, but in collaboration with them. But you're totally right in your, in your arguments. And I won't of course dare to tell you that you are not right. That they, it's just, we don't have a model right now to understand the quantity of exosomes that they can do that. We use a model, that's it, definitely. You are, but you are There's right. some limitations to biomedical research and sometimes, yeah. you know, uh, we can't dissect all mechanisms at the same time. and. Yeah. We have to maybe there are no the winners, systems so for. Yeah. I'll 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 bring the I'll skip you, Carolina, for a little while, and you will come back to you in, in a few seconds. And we go to Anirban uh, Chaudhry. Uh, could you unmute yourself and ask a question, please? Yeah. So uh, my question is, uh, how does these EVs actually represent the uh, whole uh, heterogeneity in the tumor mass? Like, uh, 
means like uh, the evs like uh, the most uh, common mutations are generally represented in the evs but the uh, mutations which are uh, like less represented in the uh, tumor mass how are they represented in the evs so yeah. uh, if we are uh, checking it uh, in with respect to therapy efficacy or uh, the uh, percentage of cells responding to a particular therapy how can these evs uh, can be used uh, in such cases totally yeah yeah you know uh, we do know that for example i can tell you about the dna story that we did uh, when i was in david's uh, we profiled the dna in the evs I had to tell I was done in, in, in vitro. So we purify the DNA from EBS. They do, if you do uh, basically whole genome sequencing and you match it, 10X whole genome sequencing, and you match it, you see the whole genome, there were some losses. So there were some gains and losses, but not really related to the model. So you the short answer is you represent the whole genome, but the pieces were small. And actually there were <clears throat> from 200, no, 100, base pairs to 10, 10 KBs, the most uh, represented. However, they were bigger or smaller, but you can align them up all the genome. So theoretically you should represent all the genome in vitro. The big question comes in vivo, when you comes to the patients, of course, they will, I, I think they will represent the whole genome as well. However, it's gonna be challenging in a liquid biopsy, for example, to have the whole genome of the tumor in EVIS. In my case, I have to say that we found most systemic DNAs. What is the basically genomic DNA? You find it a lot and you can find it, but the tumor DNA, if you don't have the ability to purify it, there will be an overwhelming information from the system, hematopoietic cell EVs and all this, that in my hands, we couldn't find the whole genome of the tumor in, in plasma, let's say that way. But potentially, you know, you only took the in vitro studies, you could, but in vivo is challenging, I have to say. It's not an easy work. And I don't, I don't, I'm not sure if we will get there, but theoretically, it should represent the whole heterogeneity. And also, there are non tumor cells in there that produce. Yeah, vesicles. yeah. That's yeah. the main limit. Uh, and maybe some of the EVs which represent the, uh, the uh, fewer or the uh, less frequent mutations. They maybe uh, get uh, means uh, get uh, like uh, uh, depleted uh, along the pathway of the uh, this uh, EV. So macrophages or other uh, may have some homing mechanisms that uh, also degrade those EVs as well. So that's maybe one of the things which uh, actually prevent. Yeah, I mean, present uh, that uh, whole post. Yeah, we have the main limitation I found not only for DNA also for protein is that of course in systemic circulation you have all the rest of the cells and they are the winners. I have to say they are the winners. So it is limiting uh, in my hands, it's limiting to, to, to really have, because if you want the whole heterogeneity, you just go, my recommendation here is normally I do for my collaborators. If you would like to understand the tumor, just go to the tumor, just take the tumor, whatever is in the tumor, you will find it in EVs and not the other way around because in EVs you will find many more image, uh, we'll say messages, but if you do profile it, that's why we did explants or we take that because in the explant, you can take the piece of the tumor and then you take the explant and do heterogeneity in that and then go to the plasma and verify that. But starting with plasma and going to the tumor in my hands is normally having a hard time. I'm not telling you that you are not able or anyone is able, but it's, it's really challenging. Okay, we shift over to Hernando. Please ask your question and meet yourself. Thank you, Jan. Uh, thank you, Hector, for such an excellent talk. I have a couple of translational questions. I don't know if you already mentioned to that, but I was amazed of the fact that you have this retention in the sentinel lymph, but in the metastatic models, you have this, uh, you know, going on. So I'm wondering if you have looked at the subpopulations that you have in those exosomes to advance the, the discovery of prognosis of, uh, you know, biomarkers of metastasis. Yeah, we, we, well, we, the short answer is no. We haven't looked at the specific subpopulation of EBs that they are represented in there. So that would be actually linking to Jan's um, comment on way, where they can go and how far they can go. I do think that in our case, we call it EBs and all this, but if you are able to uh, do the different subpopulation, I don't know, exomere, small EBs, big EBs, we will have probably differential 
not only biodistribution, but effect. But in our case, we didn't look at that, but we have evidences that smaller particles can go deeper in leaf nodes, particles meaning nanoparticles can go deeper in the, in the leaf nodes and they can modulate the immune system. This is linking to, uh, to Jan's question. So depending on the subpopulation, they will definitely, in my, in, in my mind, they will definitely have differential role. Maybe not driven through this specific targeting, but maybe because of the physical properties. I'm going to extend that question a little bit and ask you about the integrins and do, do some vesicles have specific integrants and, and are they subpopulations or not? Or random? Well, well we, we better ask that to David, right? Uh, so they definitely, yeah. you know. Uh, so I, uh, the short answer is again, as I don't know, because since I left David's lab and he was working in integrants, we never, you know, I, I tried to avoid the, this field. Of course, you know, I respect him, but I have to say that all the studies we did in there, when I was there, we did as a whole population. We didn't do uh, analysis in a specific subpopulation. And I cannot answer with knowledge because, of course, I guess they will be doing that because they have this AFF4 and all this. I don't have it in Spain, but um, my guess is they will be differences. My guess is, of course, one pathway uh, of normally integrins are in this recycling pathway, maybe bigger EBs. And a smaller bees based on the, you know, on the papers and the proteomic analysis, these were not the main markers of exomeres, for example. So my guess again is that they will be different, but I have no idea, I have to say. So we go to Giuseppina. Please unmute yourself and ask your question. I, I had another, I have a second question, Jan. Sorry. Okay, follow up, Fernando, then. Okay. Yes, no, it's just an interesting question because I am wondering if there are any uh, advances in selectively inhibiting exosome secretion from melanoma cell lines. Well, I'm not sure about the advances, I have to say, because, uh, you know, when, I, when we were, when we published the paper in, in 2012, we knocked down, we, well, yeah, knocked down uh, RAP27A. And we do see, uh, let's say, down regulation of exosome secretion, and we did see reduction in metastasis. So I can say, yesterday we were discussing with another group that the higher secretion you have, the higher metastatic proteins, may maybe because you have a lot of interaction. And if you reduce that, and in our case we did with RAT27A, we reduced the metastasis. We didn't block it, because also we saw a, a collateral effect, which is cell death. So if we once, uh, I remember perfectly when I was a postdoc now struggling with this review of the paper, we did the knockdown of the rat 27 a there were appearing cells, they were with GFP and there were appearing cells dead floating around all green, all green infected cells. So when we knocked down uh, exosome secretion, we killed a lot of cells, but probably because they need it, you know, because exosome they need for that. So we are, we, I think we need answering specifically to, to your question is, and I always struggle in this, what is the onco EV secretion? Is there any specific pathway for oncogenic yeah. secretion? Yeah. And yeah. honestly, maybe it's utopic. Maybe they it won't. I mean, it's something that, but if we find a way, this is an idea for post -op. Now, if we find a way to knock down the uh, secretion of oncogenic material in EVs, that was something that we would bet for, but in my hands, we only knock out the main general uh, yeah. pathway. And we did see a reduction in that. If you, prom we saw also some effect with the, uh, the, the inhibitor of the sphingomyelin, you know, the G, W, blah, blah, blah. In this, we saw also a reduction, but this is a more general. So we, yeah. we only yeah. were reducing exosomes and microvesicles, and we did see an impact on metastasis as well. But you know, overall, if you inhibit, you reduce, but you have to know what to, to inhibit in that Okay. Time. If you have any further you. comment, Hernando, very brief. No, no, thank you so much. Okay. okay. Thank you. Uh, then we'll go to Josepina, please. Uh, hi, hello. Thank you for your presentation. Uh, I have uh, two technical questions. Uh, is it better to search uh, exosomal mutation in serum or plasma? And uh, the method that you use, uh, which is bet better, uh, which method is better to isolate exosome? And uh, the last is um, 
uh, it is possible to have a different exosome population with different cargo in this manner to have uh, um, to show this different trovism. Yeah, so regarding the first question, I had to say that all our work was done in plasma. So it okay. is. And that was because, uh, you know, I, we never tested. We tested, uh, when I was at Davis Leiden Laboratory, we tested heparin tubes and EDDA tubes. And of course, uh, what I found is they are not actually comparable. So we have different, uh, different uh, experiments and we found that they are not equally represented. But at that time, I didn't look for DNA. So I cannot say in detail if there is difference between serum and plasma and DNA, maybe there is someone that can have that. But in our hands here in Spain, when I moved, we only use EDTA tubes and only plasma. And in here, I can say that there are some people telling that maybe serum is because they have heparin and this interferes with the isolation, blah, blah. So in my recommendation, I can say that plasma is working nice with that. And the method we use for the paper, that was a combination of circulating free DNA and EV nucleate acids, so both DNA and RNA. We were collaborating with exosome diagnostics, which I understood that they are using the filtration system, not ultra centrifugation. So we use filtration and analysis of everything. So you can tell me, I, how you dare to tell me that you use this? So is this happening? We combine all the fraction, but that was because we wanted to increase the sensibility, not the purity. I have to say that if you analyze this impurity, they won't be pure. They will be basically all the material nucleic acids that are in circulation. So it is a limitation, although we follow, they call it uh, EVNA, but it's also a combination. It's nucleic acids overall in circulation. And sorry, the last question was, uh, I, I forgot. Uh, the last question is uh, if uh, it is possible to have a different exosome population with a different cargo, uh, in this manner you have, um, have a different trophism. Yeah, definitely. So, so it's, it's like what, uh, there was a question before. So in the uh, paper- Yes, we it's similar, yeah. <laughs> No, no, I can briefly, you know, answer. Uh, in, the, in the paper we published with David about mm -hmm. the integrities, we were using already tropic metast metastatic models. So mm -hmm. they were 231 cells that were tropic to the land, tropic to the liver, to the brain. So we could find the message. But when the tumor is already selected, so if, if it's already tropic, then they will have this message. However, in the reality, in the clinic, you won't have that. You will have a heterogeneous tumor. And this is when the reality comes, no? And in a heterogeneous tumor, you will have all the messages, all the integrins in different subpopulations. But if you already have a tropic models, it is a more homogeneous. It's like a clone, let's say that way. And this makes sense, but you know, in the real life, unfortunately, we have a lot of heterogeneity in that. So uh, we have one last fundamental question before I give it back the word to Carolina, and that's from Rashid Dool. Could you unmute yourself and ask a question? It's an interesting kind of question. It's a, it's a tough one though. Hello. Yeah, yes. I'm, I'm Rashid from the South Korea, uh, Jeonju Medical University's medical school. Actually, I have one question about the, is, is it possible to measure the exosome inside the exosome piece and the, the, how's the role of exosome in inside the calcium role? Because yeah, well, calcium and pH. Yep. Yeah, yeah. Actually, so, you have a comment mean, on that? Yeah, yeah, I can comment definitely. You know, there is actually a good work with Guillaume uh, here in France uh, that he, they are using this pH lorine. So basically they did, uh, there is a group in France which I can, you know, put in contact or just look in, in, in the detail that they are having sensors of pH but depending on the protein they see, and they engineer a protein which is sensible to the pH. And actually it glows when it's out of the cell and not when it's in. And they develop this model that is really cool. Uh, and there are already people working in detecting the pH in these exosome markers. But in the exosome, of course, depending on, the, on where they are, 
this is glowing or not glowing. In re regarding to, to calcium, I have to say that I never work in this field and I, I honestly have no idea about the calcium sensor, but I guess uh, uh, there will be some calcium sensor that you can engineer to put you know, in CD9 or whatever. So they can be engineered to put in the vesicles. But I'm not sure if Jan or Carolina, because, they know how they work. Because, uh, because I have another question about the, because uh, calcium is uh, act as a transcription factor. So my thinking is the, in, in the cancer model, uh, in mm -hmm. cancer, uh, cancer cell, they have a, uh, calcium is the most uh, play the role in the exosome um, release and also the, uh, protein transcription and uh, the mutation of the gene. Yeah, totally. And also micro vesicles. Because, are dependent on plasma, right? because I, I work in the ear stress and autophagy. Uh, you know, auto, I, when the ear stress is increased, that times is exosome, uh, calcium is released from the ear mainly. And then, then the when the calcium is more released in cytosol, that times the autophagy is increases and the exosome or uh, calcium is also the marker of the stimulant of exosome. For this reason, I have a question about that. The uh, calcium is act as a transcription factor. How can it uh, modify the our inside the inside uh, of exosome materials? That means the uh, protein, mutant protein, or uh, mi microRNA. Yeah, yeah, and, and I think you know my recommendation here is you can engine. Why don't you engineer a model so they can retarget to the EVs, so they can be sensing uh, this either calcium or pH. I would say that I know that there are people already with that, but maybe calcium. You have a sensor that is glowing with high calcium or not glowing. Maybe it answers your question, but honestly, it's a little bit out of my field. And so maybe there are already people working that, but uh, I have no knowledge, but it is totally really a good question. And of course, I encourage you to develop that system and publish it, right? So thank you very much, Hector, this was, and everybody for participating in this discussion. That was absolutely great. Before we finish, I have to give over the word back to Carolina because she has a very important message to you all. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Jens, for leading the question and answer. And Hector, it was fantastic presentations and obviously lots of data and interesting uh, insights in there. Actually, I have like a sort of curiosity whether you, with the integrins, um, have you tried whether uh, we, we, you knock down all the integrins, are they um, affecting any sort of like uh, metastasis uh, to the to different sites or uh, is there sort of a, a study like that? I'm not sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, there is uh, data in the field. Uh, one thing is, of course, in the cell. So actually, we were uh, collaborating recently with Ramon y Cajal here in Barcelona, and we found that beta-3 integrin is critical for also the recycling of EVs, and also uh, we just published a nature communication paper with him. But at the cellular level, integrins, once you touch an integrin and he touched, for example, beta-3, you reduce metastasis. You, do, you won't have metastasis or you reuse it a lot. Also with David, we did an analysis in exosomes. So if you knock out in exosomes, those exosomes are not able to either home lungs or home liver, or you use integrin blockers and you won't have homing. Actually in the, in the world that we are having with the lymph nodes, we also saw that integrins play a role. If you inhibit them, Exosomes on how they won't see the extracellular matrix and they pass through. So it's kind of, for me, the integrins are kind of the, when you have this toll, uh, you have to pass the toll or not. So you have this uh, ID to pass the toll or if you don't have it, you will pass through and that's it. So I think this kind of ID for those exosomes. But at cellular level, definitely, if you knock out integrins, a specific they affect metastasis and okay. it's depending mostly on the model if you use pancreatic cancer breast cancer it's a lot of litter it's a whole new where i'm a little bit lost but they do have an impact yeah it's a lot of data about that uh, it's a lot level of the integrins that's true yeah. Uh, yeah okay so i think in the interest of time uh we'll wrap it up uh and thanks so much again uh hector that's fantastic uh, for today's session, also there's a lot of questions and that was really great.